OK, so let's start mathematics from the beginning. Let's do it with this visual language, which allows us to explain all of these ideas from elementary mathematics and the theory of computation and logic. And let's do it all with this visual language, which makes everything very explicit, very easy to understand where there's no need for any algebra. And the only things we need to know to begin are basic ideas of arithmetic. And we're going to use this visual language of wiring diagrams because it's a common language behind all of these different ideas. And we can use wiring diagrams to understand exactly what's going on, starting from the very basics and going all the way to some really advanced ideas in mathematics. This is a visual course that I think anybody's going to be able to follow, and I really hope you enjoy it. What I want to do to begin is just to start to explain what these wiring diagrams are and how we can use them to think about mathematical ideas. What we're also going to see is that lots of different ideas can be explained in the same language. And this is where I think things start to get very, very beautiful because it's not just going to be things like arithmetic that we're going to be able to talk about. We're going to be able to talk about logic and how to reason and also about computation. And literally we're going to be able to write computer programs within this same kind of graphical or visual language. And so really, I would say that what this language is, is a kind of meeting point for lots and lots of very important things in mathematics and computer science that people are interested in. And all of these ideas meet in this very kind of simple language, which I sort of feel strips away all of the irrelevant things and just leaves this very nice visual kind of pictorial view of what's going on. OK, so the idea behind these wiring diagrams is very, very simple. The idea is just that we have these boxes which perform operations. So, for example, this box performs the operation of adding one. And the idea is that this box can have an input wire and an output wire. So we're going to be drawing lots of wires and we can usually think of these wires as carrying information. So in this case, these wires are going to be carrying numbers. So if the input wire carries in a three, then when we do this plus one operation on that three, we end up getting a four out. And so you can think of this box here, this plus one box as a kind of process or machine that takes in an input, in this case, a number, and it just adds one to it. So for today, all of the wires that I draw are just going to be wires that carry numbers. And we're going to think about these different arithmetic operations that we can do. So this box here takes one input, which is a number, and it has one output, which is a number. And it does this operation of adding one to the inputs. Here's another box. This box is just called plus. And to do plus or addition, we need to have two numbers as inputs. And then we get one number as an output. So for example, if we put in a three and we put in a one, then what we get out is three plus one, which is four. And so you can see that this box here takes two input numbers and it gives us one output number. Today, I'm always going to assume that these wires are carrying information flowing downwards. I might not always draw these little directed arrows on the wires, but they're always taking the information downwards. OK, then. So now we've seen a couple of different kinds of boxes. This one here takes one input and produces one output. And this box here takes two inputs and produces one output. Now you can think of lots of mathematical operations in terms of these boxes. For example, there's another one called multiply. Again, again, it takes in two numbers 
and it outputs one number. So if you input a three and a four, then the output is going to be three times four, which is 12. Okay, so, so far, we've just seen this kind of box that has one input and one output, and these kind of boxes that have two inputs and one output. So here's another case. This box here has no inputs and one output. So the way that you can think of this, this is the number one. And all it does is it produces a number one, which is going to flow down this wire. This is a sort of box that doesn't require any inputs. If you want to do plus one, you need to tell me what you want me to add one to, right? You want to say, oh, do plus one on three or do plus one on five. You need to supply some kind of input. But if you just want to produce for number one, you don't have to give any input. Now, the real magic here is what happens when we combine these boxes together. This is what we call composition or composing things. So we have this box one here, and that's just going to produce a one that's going to flow down this wire. But what we want to do with this is we want to do some addition. So let's also produce a number three. So we have this other kind of box here that again has no inputs and it just produces this number three. So there's going to be a three flowing down this wire. And then what I want to do is I want to add these two numbers together. And so I have this addition box. And this is going to take these two inputs, this one and this three, and it's just going to add them together. And so what the result's going to be is one plus three. Okay, so now it's time to introduce the really big idea here. And that's that when we have one of these wiring diagrams, we can always collect together a load of things that are happening within it and use those things to form another box that does more operations at the same time. Let me explain what I mean. It's a very simple idea. So let's say that we start off with a number one, and then what we're going to do is this plus three operation. And that's going to output a number. So because this is a wiring diagram, we can draw a box anywhere we like, for example, here. And now we can think of this box as another sort of operation. And it has the sort of net effect of everything that's happening inside. So what's happening inside this green box? Well, what we're doing is we're producing a one and then we're adding three to it. And if you think about it, that's pretty much the same thing as just starting with a number four. Okay, that's the net effect of producing a one and then adding a three to it. And so what we can say is that basically these two wiring diagrams uh, this one on the left and this one on the right, are in some sense equal. They're doing the same thing. The net effect of both of these wiring diagrams is just to make a number four that is going to be produced and flow down this wire. But another way you can think of it is that if we sort of box off this top part of the diagram, then this kind of part that we've boxed off is basically going to be the sort of operation that just makes a four. And so we can really replace all of this top stuff here just with this kind of operation that just makes a four. Let's have a look at another example because this is really essential for this course. This is actually the main idea. So here's another example. Let's say we do this plus one operation. So this takes a wire, takes a number, and it gives us another number. Now we're going to do 
another plus one operation. And so we're going to consider this sort of composition of these two operations. So how are we to think of this? Well, if we start off with a number, let's say three, we add one to it, we get four, and then we add one again, we get five. Well, we can see that the net effect of this is just that we're going to end up adding two to our input. So we could say that this wiring diagram here is equal to this wiring diagram here, where all we do is just add two to our input. And again, this is the idea of composition. We could say that if we compose this box and this box, it makes this box. Now, an easier way to think about this, I think, is that whenever we have a wiring diagram, we're free to draw a sort of box anywhere we like, and then just think about all the processes that are happening within that box as some kind of combined operation. In this case, this is going to be doing a plus two operation. Now, this turns out to be a really neat idea because, for one thing, it allows us to make new boxes based on the old boxes that we have. So, what about this plus one operation? How can we understand that? Well, let's say that we start with some sort of operations, like let's say we have plus, and this is given to us. So we can always take in two numbers and make another number. And let's say that we also have this sort of box, which is called one, which takes no inputs and produces one output. It makes a one flow downwards along this output wire. So now we can compose these two different boxes together. We can assemble them to make a plus one operation. And here's how it works. We're going to use a plus and we want our inputs to come in along this left wire. And then along this right wire, we just want to make this one. And we're going to be using this one, adding it to our left input. And here comes our output. And now if we just sort of box this off, like so, we can call this box plus one. And we can take this to be the sort of definition of this kind of a plus one box here. So let's just see how this works. Okay, if we compose this with, let's say, a five here. Well, the five and the one are just going to come in here and we're going to get six out here. So yes, basically we can think of what's going on here as just having this plus one operation. And in this example, we're going to be doing this on five. And here comes our output. And if we like, we can evaluate this whole thing like so. And we can just say that this is equal to this thing that makes six out of nowhere. So you can see that we can represent lots of arithmetic, lots of basic arithmetic using these kind of ideas. Okay then, so to cement these ideas, here are a couple of puzzles for you to think about. The first one is what does this do? Okay, so what does this net process do? Another way I could say it is if I box off all of this stuff at the top here, then what's a kind of simpler description of this kind of green box that I've drawn at the top. Or another way you can say it is, if you do all of these operations here, what ends up coming out on this wire? So that's the first thing to think about. The second problem might take a bit more thought. And the problem is what type of processes can you make using these boxes? And basically what I want to know is, if you can have any number of copies of this and this, and you have to put them together to make some kind of a process with one output, 
or some kind of a box with one output. What different boxes with one output can you make by assembling things from these boxes? So if you want to pause the video and think about this, go ahead. Um, so I'm going to tell you the answers now. So for this first one, the way that we can solve this problem is to just keep simplifying the problem in small steps. So firstly, if we box off this part of the diagram, we can see that what we're doing is we're taking a one and a three and we're adding them together and that's going to make four. So this whole green box is like a four. Another way that we can draw it is we can just rub out this stuff and we can put a number four here. Now, what we're doing here is we're taking a four and a two and multiplying them together. And so that's going to result in eight. And that's the answer. For this problem here, I said that we need to have, I said that we need to have a result with one output. So the simplest thing we can do is to just use our one like that and not use times two at all. The only other way we can get one output is if that's an output of times two. And then in that case, times two needs an input. And that input could be produced by using a one, or it could be produced by using another times two. And then that would need an input. And so you can see that the different answers are that we could just make a one, or we could make a one, and then we can times by two, or we can make a one and we can times by two and then times by two. And in this case, the answer will be four. And then we could also take a one and then times by two and times by two and times by two. And then the answer would be eight. Um, we could also get 16 and so on. And so the answer to this is that we can make any of the sorts of powers of two, uh, one or two or four or eight or 16 or 32 or 64 and so on, based on how many times we use this multiplied by two box. Okay, so now it's time to connect to logic. So we're going to introduce a new box and we're going to call it question mark equals. And this box takes in two numbers and it outputs a number. And what this box does is it tells us if the two inputs are the same. So the idea is that when we put two inputs in that are the same, then a one is going to come out of this wire at the bottom. But if the inputs are not the same, then a zero is going to come out of this bottom wire. So what we're doing here really is we're sort of trying to include logic in our system or the idea that we can test if things are equal to each other. So what we're really doing here is we're trying to connect with ideas of logic and we're sort of using zero to represent false and we're using one to represent true. Like I actually think that this should be done a lot more at school. I think that kids have a lot better idea about zero and one than they do about false and true, which seem a lot more abstract. And, you know, true is sort of something that's there. False is kind of like something that's not there. I think this is a, a good way to think of it. But no matter what, using these kind of ideas of zero and one to represent false and true is going to be really good for us because we can just keep with this simple idea that these are just numbers flowing along our wires. So we can imagine, we'll imagine that every wire uh, just has one of these kind of whole non-negative numbers running along it. So the only wire, the only numbers that will allow to flow along our wires are zero, one, two, three, and so on, just these uh, natural numbers. And now we've got this new kind of operation, which is allowing us to test if things are equal or not. So here's a question for you. Let's suppose that 
you have these boxes that you can use. You can use plus. You can use this thing that tests if things are equal. We can call this an a, a quality tester if we like. And you can use five. And you can use one. And the question is, can you assemble these things to make a box which is going to take in a single input and then add one to it and then test if the result is equal to five. So I'd encourage you to pause the video and see if you can draw out such a wiring diagram. So let's give it a go. So let's give it a go. Here comes our input. Then we're going to use this plus and we're going to add one to it. And now what we want to be doing is this equality test. And we're using the output from this and we're testing if that's equal to five. And here comes the results. And so if we box this off, then we can see that this is going to work. So if we give this an input, let's say we give it an input of four, well, the four is going to go in, we're going to add one to it. So we're going to get a five here. Now we've got a five coming in on this wire and a five coming in on this wire. These two things are equal. And so a one comes out, which means yes, this is a number which has a property that if we add one to it, we get five. On the other hand, if we put, let's say a seven in here, well, then we get an eight here. That's not equal to five. So we're going to get a zero out of the bottom here. So this box here that tests if two numbers are equal or not, I'll maybe often write that just like this. Okay, so I'll just write the equal sign just because it's easier. So it turns out actually that with the things that we've already introduced, we can already do quite a lot of logic. So if we just consider what we can do with these boxes, so the one that makes a zero, the one that makes a one, the box that does addition, the box that does multiplication, and the box that checks equality. It turns out that if we assemble these, we can already think about pretty much all of logic, at least the most basic kind of logic that people use. But this is really beautiful, I think, because it, it gives a tremendous amount of insight into the way that logic works, which is usually only possessed by people who've done fancy degrees and manipulated loads of symbols. So let's see how this works. So firstly, what about this number one here? Well, this is just going to make a wire which has a one flowing along it. Now, sometimes we can see by the way that our diagram is that one of these wires uh, is going to have the feature that the number flowing along it can only be a zero or a one. It can't be a two or a three or anything else. Uh, and sometimes I'm just going to mark such a wire with a little dash like that. Now, that is not really formally important, okay? This is not some sort of formal notation that is really part of a system. It's just a kind of um, visual thing to let you know that this is a type of wire which could only have a zero or a one flowing along it because of the way that it's set up. So you can see that, of course, in this case, we can instantly see that this wire can only have a one flowing along it because, hey, it just has something that only makes ones above it. But the reason that I'm highlighting this is because these wires that only have zeros or ones flowing along them have a nice interpretation in terms of logic. If a wire has a zero flowing along it, we can say that it's saying that something's false. It's kind of pushing this false signal, which is coming down. And um, 
if the wire has a one flowing along it, then it's basically having this true signal coming along it. So it's just this idea that we can think of zero as false and one as true. And a wire that can only have zeros or ones going along it is sort of like something that's telling us a logical value, either a false or a true. And this is basically the same thing that happens in computers. Um, you know, when you're, uh, when the computer's manipulating all of these ones and zeros, it's, you know, messing about with these truth values by firing them along wires and combining them and so on. We can think of this then as true. This is just making a one. This one, which has a zero here, we can think of this as false. So let's now try and think about some other logical operations. So here's another one. What about this times here? I think this is very interesting. So we know what multiplication does on numbers, but now let's just sort of restrict our attention to what happens when these kind of um, logical values of true and false are coming along the wires. It sounds complicated, but all I'm really trying to say is what does times do when the inputs are either zeros or ones. Well, we could easily work this out, okay? So what's what happens when we times zero and zero? Well, we end up getting zero. What about if we times a zero and a one? Again, we end up getting zero. Same thing if we do it the other way around because it doesn't matter which order you multiply numbers in. And if we multiply a one and a one, then we end up getting a one. And so what we can see is that when we take in two of these kind of logical values, either zeros or ones, and we times them together, we end up getting out such a logical value. And actually what this is, is it is and. Okay, so if you haven't seen this before, this is really worth meditating on. Basically, if you have a couple of numbers which are either zero or one, and you times them together, that's kind of the same thing as doing and on values which could be false or true. What do I mean? So this idea that and is just like multiplying when you're using zero or one is like a very profound idea. If you haven't seen it before, it's well worth meditating on. So let's let's think about an example. So let's say there are these two statements here. It's sunny and I'm outside. And each of these statements can either be true or false. So we could say that they have a true value. Now, I want to use zero and one instead of the words false and true. So we could say that there's a truth value for this statement, it's sunny, and there's a truth value for this statement, out, I'm outside. For example, it might be the case that it is sunny, so we can give this a one because it's true, and I'm outside, so we can give this a one because it's true. Now, the whole statement here, that I'll put like this, is like this statement and this statement. And the way that we can think of and in terms of these truth values is that the truth value of the whole statement here is the truth value of this statement times by the truth value of this statement. So in this case, if this statement here is true, that's a one. And if this statement here is true, then the whole statement, it's sunny and I'm outside, its truth value is one times one which is one, right? Because if it's true that it's sunny and it's true that I'm outside, then it's true that it's sunny and I'm outside. On the other hand, let's say it's sunny, but I'm not outside. Well, again, the same kind of formula holds. So to work out the truth value 
associated with this big statement here with the and, we just do the true value of it's sunny, so that'll be a one, times the true value of I am outside, which will be a zero. And we get one times zero, which is zero. So that makes sense, right? Because if I'm not outside, then the statement it's sunny and I'm outside is false. So you can see that and basically works the same way as timesing together numbers, which are either zero or one, where we interpret zero as meaning false and one as interpreting true. So this is really cool because what we're seeing is that this very, very simple language that we have can do logical stuff. It can do the kind of stuff that happens in computers and philosophy departments and things. It's, um, it's very interesting that we can build up all of these fancy ideas from these really basic blocks. So, okay, here's another interesting thing that we can do. What we can do is we can make a box that checks if something is equal to zero. So the easiest way is just to show you how to build this thing. So the idea is that we're going to use this equality checker. Remember, this takes in two numbers as inputs and it gives us a number as an output. That's going to be a one if the inputs are the same and a zero otherwise. And we're just going to use this equality checker together with a zero here. So all this is going to do is it's just going to test if this input number here is equal to zero or not. So we could say that this is, well, let's give it a name. Let's call this box question mark equals zero. So here it is. It's just going to take in a number and it's going to output a one if that number is zero, otherwise it's going to output a zero. Now we can see that the output here is going to be one of these logical values, either a true or a false. Like I say, we don't really have to mark our wires um, to show that they're carrying logical values only, but we can. And when we're talking about logic, it kind of helps. So this, it turns out, is a really cool kind of thing because actually what we can think of this as is not. Okay, so this is pretty interesting. You might know in logic that one of the things that is really useful is this word not because it kind of switches around a truth value. Like if something's not true, then it's false. If something's not false, then it's true. So what we would kind of like is some kind of an operation that can take in a truth value, either a zero or a one, and then it sort of flips it around. So if a one goes in, then a zero comes out. If a zero goes in, then a one comes out. And, you know, we could just define a box to do that. There's no problem there. But the really cool thing is that we already have such a thing. And it's this that we've already made. So we can just use it. Question mark equals zero. So what we're going to do now is we're going to prove that this type of thing does what we want it to do. Now that might sound complicated, but with this graphical language, it's incredibly easy. All we have to do is to show that if we put a zero in here, we get a one out. And if we put a one in here, then we get a zero out. So let's do that. Now we know that the definition of this thing here is as shown in this picture here. So all we have to do is to check this. So if we put a zero on this wire, well, zero is equal to zero. And so we get a one out. On the other hand, if we put a one in this wire, one's not equal to zero. And so we get a zero out. So really this we can think of as being not. Now, again, um, it doesn't have to be that this input wire um, has to be 
like one of these truth value um but it kind of helps for us to understand this in terms of logic if this is going to be a true value so remember what's going on here what i'm really saying to be technical is that these wires um, can carry any non-negative whole numbers but what i'm also saying is that when we sort of restrict our attention to the case where these wires only are equal to only carry zeros or ones i'm saying that in that case this type of operation here acts just like not but it's also true that this operation is defined for you know numbers which are bigger than one so you know this is a kind of consistent thing anyway but i'm just saying that when we're handling logical values it acts like not <clears throat> and that's kind of one of the things i like about this language because it's sort of minimalistic and kind of simple i mean you know most people understand arithmetic but it also can be interpreted you know in terms of logic and stuff so because i'm talking about logic a lot um it's going to help if we sort of come up with some alternative names for some of these boxes okay so this one here that checks if something is equal to zero now i'm really just defining this as an ordinary box it takes in a number and it spits out a number but i'm sometimes just going to call it not okay just another name for the same box and that's because when we're dealing with these kind of logical values it acts like not yeah it sends a, a true to a false and it sends a false to a true so it's a good name for it um so to get sort of used to this let me ask you a question and the question is what is this composition here so we're going to start with a one or a true if you like and then we're going to do not and then we're going to do not so what i'm asking here is what does this result in um, in other words what does it mean if i say something is not not true well we can just figure it out so maybe you can pause the video and have a go if you want um so here's the answer if we just box off this top part this means not true so now we can like fill in the meaning of this this really means uh, we're doing this is it equal to zero operation on our one and then clearly one's not equal to zero and so uh, we're going to have a one flowing in here we check if a one's equal to zero it's not so we get a false here or a zero and so we can see that this green box here just ends up giving us a zero another way you could think of it is simply to say that you know false is not true um but anyway and now we just do the same kind of idea again so this is going to spit out a zero this not really means checking if the thing's equal to zero zero is equal to zero so we get a one here so the net effect of all this is just to make a one so basically not not true means true at least you know for us today with this kind of logic that's that's what happens so um you might want to think about other things for example what's it mean to say something is not 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 false so uh if you want you can try and understand that as well and i, I think uh, if you haven't you know played around with logic like this before it's it's like a very cool thing to do because you start to see logic as more of a kind of um game or something where you're playing around with machinery or lego blocks um rather than just something that kind of involves um this more inflexible language so 
I really love this idea that once we have these primitives, I mean, remember these kind of primitives or basic building blocks that we started with were just these. And that once we have these, we can put them together to get so many other structures. I mean, it's kind of like Lego. If Lego like tells you about every structure, you know, that, that you can think about just about, it's, it's pretty crazy. Like, so for example, it's fundamental to be able to test if things are equal, but also what about testing if things are not equal? What about if we want something that takes in a couple of numbers and it's going to output a true if those numbers differ, otherwise it gives a false. Well, that's just the same thing as set testing if two numbers are not equal. And even from the language, we can see that we can make something that does that just by testing if two things are equal and then doing this not operation afterwards. So we can define this box here that tests if inputs are not equal as this composition here. So I want to finish by talking about or. Okay, so, so to do this, it's probably going to be easier if we actually keep writing and. So you remember before I was trying to convince you that like when we're dealing with numbers that are just zero or one, this kind of and logical thing looks pretty much the same as multiplication. So let's just define those things to be the same, right? We'll define this box called and to be the same thing as this box that does multiply. In other words, sometimes I'll write and instead of times. Um, and so now what we can do is we can define or. So what does or mean in logic? Um, well, I've made this little table here to, to uh, illustrate what or means. Basically, when we have two logical values and we say um, one or the other, what we mean is that it's not the case that they're both false, okay? So here I have two statements, it's sunny and I'm outside. And when I say it's sunny or I'm outside in logic, what we mean is that it's not the case that it's sunny is false while I'm outside is also false, okay? Um, so it's a little bit strange with or because sometimes in our everyday language, when we say or, we mean just that like exactly one of these two statements is true. But normally in logic and also for us today, when we say this or this, well, that just means that it's not the case that they're both false. Okay, so let's just uh, make this explicit. Uh, if it is sunny and I am outside, then it's true that I'm sunny or I'm outside. If it's not sunny and I'm outside, then it's true that it's sunny or I'm outside. If it's sunny but I'm not outside, then it's true that I'm sunny or I'm outside. But if it's not true that it's sunny and it's not true that I'm outside, well then the statement it's sunny or I'm outside is false. So that's how or works. So the big question is, can we assemble the kind of pieces that we've already got to make a box that does this kind of or operation? It takes in two values and it gives us out um, either a zero or a one and it acts like or. So I think it's a hard problem if you haven't seen it before. Um, I'm about to show the answer. Uh, so it's up to you if, if you're feeling brave, you know, pause the video and see if you can do it. Um, here's the answer. So here's how it works. Well, all we have to do is to sort of prove that this is going to act like or. So if we put two things that are false in, we hope to get a false as an output. So let's see if we do. Not false is true. Not false is true. True and true is true not true is false. So yes, that works. Now let's test it for some different inputs. Any other inputs that we could put into this thing, we would hope would give us a true as an output. So what if we put a one and a zero? 
Well, not true is false. Not false is true. False and true is false. Not false is true. So that works. Obviously, it's going to be the same if we put the true in on the right and the false in on the left. What about if we put two trues in? Well, not true is false. Not true is false. False and false is false. Not false is true. So yeah, that works as well. So yes, it turns out that this allows us to define or. So okay, let's um we've looked at lots of things today, uh, lots of logic stuff. So as a final kind of challenge, and I strongly encourage you to have a go at this, um, let's see if we can assemble all of our sort of primitive operations to get something that can do this. So we want to make a box. It's going to take in two numbers and it's going to check if this condition holds. The condition that one plus the first number is five and also that the second number is seven. So um, I'm going to go through the answer of this now, but like I strongly encourage you to just have a go at this. Um, it's really worth doing. So let's let's give it a go. So what what do we want to do? Um, take in this first number and then add one to it. And then we want to check if that number is equal to five. So we want to be using that and testing if this is five. Also, what we want to be doing is checking if our seven, second number is equal to seven. So here comes our second input and we want to test if that's equal to seven. And then we want to check if both of these statements are true. So what we want to do now is an and. And we remember that and is the same thing as times. So this is the answer. And personally, I find this diagram like a hundred times easier to read than this sentence. Even with the sentence, I had to sort of bracket it off because it's difficult to even, you know, logically state what we're doing in language without, you know, having to be very kind of careful and clear. Whereas here, um, I think it's very quick to communicate to somebody what type of thing you want to do. So um, I strongly urge you to think about some more kind of logical uh, problems. Like a really great thing to do, this is a really great exercise, is to sort of start out with these primitive operations and then to just think about all of the things that you can make, let's say by sticking two of them together. So you could say, well, um, I'll take any pair of these things and see what are the different ways that I can compose them and then try and understand what that means. And if you do that, if you make like an exhaustive table of all of the kind of ways that you can combine two of these operations, you'll get a tremendous amount of insight into all of this stuff. And what we're dealing with here is really the absolute basics, I would say, um, of mathematics. And if you believe, you know, that mathematics underlies physics, you know, in a way you're dealing with the sort of primitive operations behind reality, right? So it's, it's so, it's so good for, it's so good to understand like how you can combine these things. And like, who knows, maybe you can think of some new way to put these things together. That's going to shed some, some new light in a different direction that no one's ever thought before.